Welcome to the Song Saloon. I'm singer-songwriter Jordan Smith Reynolds, and today I'm meeting with Timmy Milner. What's up? I'm Timmy Milner. Each week I meet with an artist and we break down one of their songs. And today we are working on Crux of a Lie. Timmy, tell us a little bit about Crux of a Lie. I wrote it while I was in the hospital a couple years ago. I have seizures sometimes, so they were doing this EEG test on me and they had all these wires on my head. I looked like a robot. I'd stay like that, like in a bed for a week. So I wrote Crux of a Lie at that time, kind of like the bare bones of it. And then when I got home, I like cleaned it up and stuff. Was it more kind of like free writing when you were in the hospital with lyrics and melody ideas? Or were you also thinking guitar patterns? Yeah, my guitar was in the room with me. I came up with the guitar line first, which is probably like most of my songs come up with like a lick or something. The main phrase Crux of a Lie just kind of came out. I didn't really understand what it meant. And then I wrote around that and learned kind of what I meant by it. It's like the thing that holds you to some false idea, I think. Trying to put words into manic ideas or like late night ideas that you have as an artist. It's about being tempted by falling into like negative thought patterns and stuff. Exploring the subconscious, I really resonate with that when listening to your song. You know, I write a lot as well. That's a space that I'm always trying to find. And that song, I settle into it because of the riff and everything. It's very, like, meditative. That's awesome. Honestly, when I wrote it, I thought it would be sleeper, like, just for me type of song. People have, like, kind of latched on that one. It was just ethereal and, like, off track in a way, you know? So I was surprised that people liked it so much. I think we'll leave that as the intro and we'll go to the performance, which we just recorded. So... I'll check that out now. Conversation in my brain leaves me on the ground. Who's to say which voice is for you? So you've been working on the song. You said you wrote it in the hospital. And that was how long ago? 2019, I think. Yeah. And then we recorded it in 2020. I remember the artwork. You have a moon on the cover. How did that come about? In the song, I say, under starlight, easy does it. Waning moonlight, easy does it. That section was the main image for me. I commissioned my friend Millie. She's a really wonderful artist living in Long Beach, actually. We used to work together in a coffee shop. It looks really nice. I think it turned out well. Yeah, she's really good. Very cool. 
I wanted to point out melody wise one of my favorite spots and just get your ideas on it in the crux of a lie in the tomb of the night is that how the melody always was going up on that in the time well, yeah tell me about that yeah it wasn't like i like sat there and said this is gonna go up or down it was just the first thing i sung over the chords and stuff which are kind of like these guitar picking major seven chords basically yeah i don't know i just went up I'm not yeah. sure why. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the starting note of the song, right? Da, 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 oh yeah. Da, 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 in the tomb of the night. I think it's a really nice call to that opening bit. And thinking about if it had instead been da 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 just it would have been a little more boring. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't have worked as well, I don't think. Yeah, I think that dissonance just sits super nice in the song cool yeah it, it is this part of the melody and sometimes annoyed that i wrote because it's difficult to sing that like random note yeah you have to sing it right in tune or it sounds very wrong i love super tight harmony yeah i like that stuff too i'm really influenced by like beach boys like smile sessions and pet sounds like that stuff really influences me heavily as well as like the beatles of course beach boys are a huge influence for me as well so lyric-wise, conversations in your brain leaving you on the ground, who's to say which voice is folly, which of them is sound, that one is repeated several times. Is that what came first to you when you were writing the song? I think that was the first lyrics I wrote for the song. Like I was saying, like negative thoughts, these like invasive thoughts. And it's like, oh, which one's me? Like, which one's a lie? Which one's false and which one's true? It's hard to know when you're in that mindset. The song feels very hopeful to me, even though you're dealing with these dark themes. And maybe that's because in the bridge, Easy does it now. It's kind of like you're dealing with all this stuff, but, you know, it feels kind of a lullaby-ish to me where it's yeah. like things are going to work out. Yeah, I'd hope so. My goal with songwriting, whether it comes across all the time or not, is hope. I really love Lord of the Rings. Just stuff that is like super bleak stories, but there's always hope. My goal with songwriting is like, there's a lot of bleakness. Let's be real about it. Let's not sugarcoat things. But like without that bleakness, we can understand how great hope is. Right. That contrast. I was actually just listening to a Big Thief song. Do you listen to Big Thief? You actually gave me the tickets to go to that show. Yeah, I did. <laughs> that was one of the best shows I've ever been to. I'm so sorry you missed it. Yeah, I actually went with Caden and Lawton. Cool. He was also like super stoked. I think he like has a new love for Big Thief after seeing oh, that good. show. It was yeah. definitely a gift that went far. We were both just like blown away. I have seen Adrian perform live, not in the band setting. It was just her in a cathedral. Seriously, one of the top concerts for me, just because it's just her guitar, cathedral space. It just felt right for her music. But she has a song with Big Thief called Change. It's the opener to the new Dragon New More Mountain I Believe in You album. And that song is about the opposites in our lives, how you need darkness to really appreciate and understand light. I think for a lot of folk artists, it's not so much like, oh, we're writing sad songs so because we're sad people. It's more like, I think the value in a folk perspective is like, there's poetry in life. And a lot of it comes from just being real about things, right? It's like, it's really hard to believe in love you know it's hard to believe in love without knowing that there's the opposite of that that contrast is really important yeah it kind of goes from that two-dimensional to three-dimensional view of those things and yeah some people really gravitate to that but i think a lot of people are afraid to sit in those feelings so i do really appreciate folk and what it does as a genre i talked to some people like telling them the music i like they're like oh yeah they're good but they're really sad well yeah are you not sad? Because <laughs> like, I mean, like when I'm sad, I want to hear something sad. I don't want to hear someone being happy all the time. Another value I think I had as a songwriter is like reaching those people who are like alone or afraid or maybe even depressed. You're not alone. And maybe me talking about this sort of situation will help them through their own specific situation that I could never understand or feel. But just helping people to know that they're not alone. Yeah. Bringing it back to the bridge, which you kind of have this hopeful message injected into the song. Can you talk about the production choices? You have like a Mellotron or something. That's part of what makes it feel hopeful to me. And just want to hear your thoughts on that. 
when I recorded it, it was at Palomino Sound in LA with my friend Jason Soda. And it was just us two in the studio because it was during 2020 lockdown. So we're kind of breaking the law or something. (laughs) (laughs) So just us two and, and he has a real Mellotron. Yeah, if you don't know what a Mellotron is, it's this really cool invention. I think from the 60s, it's like essentially a bunch of tapes that are all shoved into an instrument. So like each note you play, you're like summoning an actual analog tape loop of this sample, essentially. It's like an early sampling instrument, but using all tape. And so he has a real one, and they sound way cooler than Logic's version or whatever. (laughs) So I was stoked. I I had already had the part in mind because I sequenced it in Logic Mm -hmm. um, and just practiced the heck out of it because I knew he had one. Just gives it so much more character than the digital version. I know what you're talking about. I used one on the Deepest of Blues. I really love the Mellotron too. Yeah, it's great. I mean, there's there's really good soft sense versions of it now, but still, it's super fun to use the real one if it's available. I think we also use the ARP, which he had, which is like another analog synthesizer. That's like the base part of that. You've gotten into some production. I know you do film composition as well. What have you done in film so far, and what are your goals? I went to school at Chapman University, where they have a big film program. I naturally became friends with a lot of like film kids. When that was their senior year, they just like sent me all their videos, and I was doing like six senior thesis projects at once. It was a lot of good experience, and I worked on other stuff when I was younger, like in school and stuff. A lot of those people have come back over the years and been like, oh, we've got this little gig for you here. I had a family friend who got me a gig doing music for a roller coaster. I composed like creepy music for this uh, roller coaster in Bush Gardens. In Bush Gardens! It's called the Cobra's Curse. That's like my claim to fame, honestly. I'm working on a really cool short film called Disassociative in Love. It's kind of like a pilot episode. They want to make like a mini series or maybe even a real series. It's my friend Amber who wrote it and is helping to get it produced. And then I'm also working on my first feature film, which is uh, Return to Fear is what it's called. It's in production right now. Can't talk about it too much, but <laughs> it's a horror movie and it's super fun to be a part of. Yeah, what's cool about doing music for movies is that you can do like styles you never would do as like your mm-hmm. artist, you know. Yeah, and then I'm sure that turns around and affects your craft as an artist too. Yeah. If I'm working on something, I'll have a guitar around. And like when something's like rendering or I'm just like at a stopping point, I'll start writing a song or something. You would think like you'd be like burnt out of like all the music work. But I think it's like kind of a different side of your brain from like songwriting. So at least for me, I can kind of do both. Yeah. Imagine it triggers things melodically. That would be interesting too. What are some of your goals, Timmy? And I'd also like to cover where people can find you. Maybe we'll start there. Where can people find you? Yeah, I'm most active social media-wise on Instagram, at Timmy Milner. If you search Timmy Milner, T-I-M-M-Y-M-I-L-N-E-R, on any of your streaming services, I should come up. I've got about 15 songs out, including my first album. Which my sister sings on, actually. Yeah, she's on two songs. Plug for that one, that's Fall Risk. Yeah, Rachel Reynolds. Also known as La Troyenne. That's right. She's a great songwriter and great singer and was super gracious to sing on that album. That was called Fall Risk was my first album. Sometimes I run out of breath and I just start talking like a little dying teddy bear. It was a really cool project where we recorded all to tape and stuff with my friend Sam Windsor. If you're just trying to dive in deep, I would say just listen to my first record. What are some of your goals? What are you up to right now? Yeah. Well, like we were talking about earlier, producing two people right now, Caden Lawton and Megan Rafferty. They're also kind of a big part of my music. Caden plays bass live and Megan sings with me sometimes. And I have a lot of music either recorded or like in-depth demos recorded. Yeah. So I might be working on re-recording a lot of it. And since I'm possibly working with a new record label situation, we'll see what they require or whatever. And I have probably three albums worth, four albums worth of music. And you've been playing live quite a lot. So I've noticed even from when I first saw you live to some of the more recent shows, it's getting really tight. Oh, thank you. I'm playing with the three-piece band, and we're a little more rocky live. 
That's with Brant Viral on drums and Caden Lawson on bass, who I was talking about before. We go in by Timmy Milner and the Happy Side for that. So if you're in the LA area, definitely check out a show. Do you have any plans for touring or anything like that? I would love to have plans for touring. Yeah, I'm kind of like stuck on day job for money right now, so it's really difficult to make a tour happen logistically. I had one planned for 2020 with my friend Kermit Obert. Anyone listening to this should check him out. Super talented singer-songwriter. Kind of has like a grungy, like Nirvana singer-songwriter thing going. We were going to do a tour together, just like go with our acoustic guitars and like, you know, do it DIY style. And we had it all ready to go. And then we got the lockdown on us. So. But that's so many years ago now. Yeah. <laughs> I can't have that excuse anymore. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully I'll tour. What was that composer thing you were talking about? Composer. Oh, Society of Composers and Lyricists. Yeah. So this is also for people in LA and New York. It's actually, you can do it worldwide. It's just going to be more beneficial if you're in one of those two hubs. They just opened in Nashville, actually, too. It's a group of composers and songwriters. And I was in the mentorship program a few years ago, which was really nice. It was a pairing of songwriters and composers that were coming up and meeting with a bunch of different composers and lyricists. So we had people like Gary Scheiman, who's done the Bioshock series, and Jeff Russo, who did the Fargo, the TV series, and Glenn Slater, who was one of the lyricists. He did Tangled and a few other things. So really cool program. They also do film premieres with like Q&As with the composers and all that stuff, a bunch of networking events. It's a great way to meet people that are also doing stuff that you enjoy and a great way to get movie tickets and digital screenings to a bunch of movies for really not that much money. I think it's a cool thing to check out. I will check it out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. Love the song and excited to share it with everyone. Thanks for bringing the song saloon. It'll be cool to see like your whole like community come together. It's been really fun so far and some really great guests, you included, of course. Thanks, Steve. All right, thanks. We'll see you next time. Thanks for stopping by the Song Saloon. Episodes are released weekly on Wednesday and you can follow on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter at The Song Saloon. And visit our website, thesongsaloon.com, where you can find past episodes, transcriptions, sign up to our email list, and find more ways to support the show. Please follow, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts. Every little bit helps grow our community of artists, songwriters, and music lovers. We truly couldn't do it without you. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week.
of the night I'll be found